Welcome back, everybody, to Hoops HD. This is our Sweet 16 edition here being recorded on Monday, March 25th. I'm your host, Chad Sherwood, joined by David Griggs and John Sleek up top here, John Titel and Joby Fortson in the bottom row. We've got a lot to get to. We had a exciting at times and incredibly boring at other times uh, first weekend of college of the NCAA tournament, but we're going to go over yeah. all the games. In, in an interesting point, uh, we were kind of discussing this. Uh, the ratings as high as they've been in 28 years, uh, which is which is kind of remarkable considering that while it had its moments, and it always does, it wasn't always pretty. Uh, there were times during the round of 32 to where there just wasn't a good game one. Yeah, uh, that so was kind of remarkable. Got, but, after the first two games on Saturday afternoon, uh, um, uh, Joby, it was a snoozer on Saturday night. It was just painful. Well, it was, yes, it was very, very painful. Uh, it, it's it's a shame that uh, – it's a shame we couldn't line them all up so beautifully uh, like our uh, Duke and UCF and – oh, wait a minute. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'll tell you what, we want to get to the tournament. We're going to pull well, the bracket up here in a minute, but I think – Well, we're part of this is symptomatic of it not being up against the AC8. We'll get to that later. <laughs> Uh, horrible things that happened news and notes portion of the show uh there's a bunch of coaching news here and uh titel you being have, having philly ties let's start in the big five where we have two coaching changes surprisingly coming in the big five this year not not the one we thought we would have so the unsurprising change was coach Dunphy retiring uh from temple uh he'll be sorely missed by penn and temple fans heck all of philadelphia will miss grand Dunphy. he was so great both on and off the court the surprise at least to me uh, Phil Martelli, 2004 National Coach of the Year. He went to the Elite Eight that year after going 27-0 and in the regular season. He's won over 400 career games, the winningest coach in school history, two-time NIT runner-up, and I hope the door doesn't hit you on the way out. I mean, uh, I, I still don't like it, and I think he's a little bitter, as he should be, and I don't envy the person who has to fill those big, big footsteps. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the guys, If of all the guys out there in college basketball right now, that's one of those guys that I just assume would coach until the day he didn't want to coach anymore at that school. And and just for the fact that the school let him go like that way, it, it it's disgusting. I really think it was. Of course, the other weird thing was he was actually fired on the feast day of St. Joseph's. Well, there we go. The, the tidbits Stalika comes up with. I, 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 no one knew that but him. Um, jo Joby, if, okay, Joby, well, you have a a quick question yeah. for our Philly guys, which I guess are you and Titel. What what prompted this? Is there a new AD? Is there a new president? Are they changing their direction? Because one of the things that I always thought Phil Martelli was great at was developing his players. Like, he wasn't getting, obviously, five-star recruits, but he was getting players in his freshman that were far, far better by their senior year. And he was – it was a formula for success. You mentioned the high-water mark of going – to the Elite Eight and being ranked number one that year, getting a one seed. But this was a team that was frequently in the NCAA tournament and, and frequently advancing. And you just wonder what the issue was. Like, uh, like I, I don't get it. <laughs> well, I can answer one of the questions for you. Their longtime AD, Don DeHooley, actually retired two years ago. Okay. So part of it is, I guess, a new AD where she's trying to put her own new stamp on the program. There had been some rumblings from some of the alumni, but I guess this would have been the time for a clean break and their, from their point of view. Yeah, well, it's just it, – it's it's a crime. And let, let's talk about a couple of the other coach, coaching news, though. Joby, I know yeah. you've got some Alabama ties. And, and yeah. Well, a huge I, shocker, I thought. Avery Johnson, I thought, you know, despite – He deserved nothing, another year. Yeah. I mean, Alabama came – I mean, we know from what, what the committee released, Alabama was one of the last four teams not in. Alabama had the potential under Avery Johnson to be that team that made the tournament two out of three years, maybe even three out of four years. Alabama needs to get it through their heads. Your program is not deemed and blessed to be like Kentucky. And guess what? You know, there aren't a lot of Avery Johnsons walking through and Nick Saban, the Nick Saban of basketball is not walking through. This is a huge, Huge mistake. He was developing a team. He actually had a great coaching job this year when basically you could argue his best two players left prematurely, whether it's Cameron Sexton 
uh, whether it's Sexton going to the NBA as, as a one and done after a great year that Avery Johnson helped guide him to, or, or it's Braxton Key going to Virginia, kind of going back to Oak Hill and going back and uh, under a hardship, uh, and now you know playing for a number one seed. You almost can't fault that. So it wasn't like he was running away from Avery Johnson. I don't understand it. There, it absolutely. Again, you miss the term again, and I also know why. They're looking across the street at Tennessee as a you know legitimate national title contender, and probably even more so, they're looking down the state at Auburn. And that is – but, guys, if you do this turnover too quick, you will become the speed bump. You will become the Wake Forest of the SEC. Who they Wake Forest should have never made their coaching change way back in the day. And they have been – with Guardino – they're paying the price over and over again, but that also leads to a segue on Wake Forest, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Danny Manning re-upped. <laughs> Danny Manning re-upped. A uh, couple of the guys that are out, Waking Jones out of Cal, not too surprisingly, the fact that they first said that they were going to bring him back. Um, Vanderbilt, another thing in the SEC title. I, I, I mean, I don't understand this firing either. It, I know they didn't win a conference game, but there were a lot of reasons they didn't, and they were competitive this year. They were atrocious this year um, due to the fact that Darius Garland, who might be a top five pick in the NBA draft, did about five games before blowing out and uh, one of his legs. Um, this is a great coach and a great player. Obviously, the buzzer beater 21 years ago in the tourney for Valpo and then two-time conference coach of the year at Valpo. And he's got the great bloodlines with his dad, Homer, at Valpo and his brother, Scott, who was in the NCAA tournament this week with Baylor. Um, He's obviously shown that he can bring in recruits. I mean, how do you hire a guy who's brought in not one, but two McDonald's All-Americans in the past year? Yeah, no, I don't understand that move either. I mean, I, I guess, you know, Owen, O for the SEC means something, but I was still giving him another year. Um, and, yeah, and he had one other, yeah, one, one other piece of coaching news, though. Uh, and this was, I was just reading this today. Last season at Georgia State in the offseason, Ron Hunter wanted a contract extension, and the university wasn't really interested in talking to him. Uh, he would still be the head coach at Georgia State right now had they actually talked to him last offseason, and he right. said that today. Uh, but, David, he's gone. He's moved over to Tulane. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's a lot better for Tulane than it is for Ron Hunter. This is a program that it might be – you know, he's going from an under-the-radar conference to one that's on the radar, but – Tulane, not really the reason the league is on the radar. <laughs> and this isn't a an athletic department that's exactly swimming in money like Scrooge McDuck. I don't know how much more he's making th than he would have been at Georgia State. I, I do think that they were foolish to not retain him, they being Georgia State, because yep. – And Georgia he, – he wanted to stay. He wanted to stay, but they didn't want to talk to him. So he left, yeah. and he got – he's going to make more money, definitely. Right. He was largely responsible for the success of that program and the marketing of the school. And um, I, I really think he kind of took it to another level, won a couple tournament games, at least one. Did he, did he win two there? I know he won. He knocked out Baylor, I want to say it was, in 13 or 14. Did but, they win two uh, years? Yeah. Oh, 15. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, you know, just – you know, you wish him well. He's really good. He's he's the best coach Tulane's had in a very long time, best one I can remember. And uh, hopefully, he can get it going there. It is it is an uphill uh, battle, though. Let's get to the to the NCAA tournament here. I'm going to pull the a portion of the bracket here, at least up on the screen. Uh, should be coming up in about half a second, if it's correctly. We're going to start in the East Region. And we're going to start with the game of the tournament and uh, Titan, one of the best tournament games I think we've seen in years. Uh, all, with all the bad games we discussed, uh, the the second round game there between Duke and UCF and, and down in South Carolina. Um, it was one of the most exciting games we've seen in a while. Yeah. I'll give you that just because I went down to the wire and Duke has been acknowledged as the heavy favorite this year. And UCF just gave them all they could handle. And it was the storyline of Coach K and his former coach and player, Johnny Dawkins, and Dawkins' kid having the game of his life, and Taco fall dunking everything, and Zion playing great. So, so many good storylines that lived up to its billing. That being said, like, they should have made that final put in, and they should have made the lob, and they should have boxed out on the free throw. So, I'm going to remember more of the mistakes that UCF made in, frankly, what I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, I think UCF choked away that game. 
I, I would agree with you. And, and I know there's a lot of complaints about some of the calls there, whether it should have been a hook and hold on that on that rebound on the free throw, whether or not that, sh that was a uh, should have been a charge on Zion before the call on, on uh, Taco Fall in his fifth foul. But but David, I, I agree with Titel, though. I think UCF made more mistakes and you can't blame the officiating, especially when you had calls like that, like like that shot clock violation that went in UCF's flavor that I thought missed the rim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. In, in uh, this is a harsh thing to say, and I want and I want to qualify it once I'm done agreeing that yeah. yes, they did make a lot of mistakes. Yes, they did choke, and you hate that. That is what is indelible about that game. After they, a lot of things had to go right for 39 minutes for UCF to be in a position to choke it away. I mean, for 39 minutes of that basketball game, UCF played the best game I can ever recall them as a program playing. And it, it was phenomenal. We watched them a lot this year. At no point did I think they had that in them to play that well. But you're right. Uh, a, a lot of things happened. There was a defensive stop late in the game where they didn't get the rebound. Uh, so Duke gets another mm -hmm. possession. They stopped them again. And uh, – they, well, it was a foul, and, and then they missed the – like, so it was an and one. Then they missed the free throw, failed to get that rebound. And so then they're down one. They went from being up three to down one after that sequence. And then they get the ball, like you had said, and they had missed a layup and then missed two tip-ins. And prior to that, there was a play that – where they had a breakaway layup and they went for an alley-oop, and that would have put them up by – was it six? It would have been up, up by six, and, and, and then Duke comes down and hits a three after that. So. Yeah, a five-point swing with less than two minutes to go in the game. But it, it, more than anything, I, I don't want to blame them for choking as much as I want to congratulate them for how well they played. And it was very reminiscent of, of Houston a year ago where, yeah, um, Michigan hit a shot from beyond half court, but – I want to say that, that like Houston had a three-point lead or a four-point lead with, with less than 30 seconds to go. The shot clock was off. And there was a sequence of three or four events to where Houston missed a free throw. Houston made a bad foul. I forget exactly what it was, but three or four things had to go exactly right for Houston to lose that game, and they did. And, and it was the same with UCF. When you're up three and you come up with a defensive stop with the shot clock off and you can't get the rebound, I mean, when you're up three and you come up with a defensive stop, I think everybody thinks you're going to win the game. And the end result was an and one, a missed free throw, where they didn't get the rebound again. <laughs> and, yeah. God, you just hate it for Well, well let's talk a uh, sleek. Let me bring you in here. Besides, Duke is on to the Sweet 16. Uh, their opponent in the next round is going to be Virginia Tech, who uh, got by St. Louis and the, and the Liberty team, team that we called it and did pull off the win over Mississippi State. Yeah, Liberty was able to pull off one upset. They were able to actually come back from a 10-point goal against the Bulldogs. And then Virginia Tech, they didn't have too much difficulty in their game against St. Louis, but the Virginia Tech-Liberty game actually looked like it was following the same script as the Mississippi State-Liberty game. But the Hokies, they did not allow a late run by the Flames. And as a result, they're actually going to their first Sweet 16 since 1967. Wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah, they, they are. And, and, uh, and Joby, we got, we got, we, we got an all ACC regional semifinal here, Duke Vatek, and it wasn't very close to two times they played in the regular season. No. Uh, well, Duke, Virginia Tech got, you know, Virginia Tech did get uh, Duke without Zion. Yeah, yeah or, or was it red? I'm trying to remember who was hurt. It was it was during the Zion injury, wow. not not the reddish, not not the uh, not the Jones injury. Right. The, um. But yeah, and Virginia Tech can play here. Virginia Tech's got a real shot. If you remember on our bracket pick, I picked an upset here. I I think it still could happen. Um. I mean, the odds are, ironically, Duke's close call against UCF might lead to a more focused Duke. And you know, everybody says, hey, there's always one near miss. And almost every championship run, there's a near miss, and that could have been Duke's. But Virginia Tech does match up well, especially now Robinson's back, who, and he was not there for the last uh, Duke game. Uh, and he's getting into the game. He's only getting about nine points a game or so, but it's, it's a contribution that they did not have before. It will come down. Can Virginia Tech nail shots? And it might ironically also come down to Duke 
being able to nail shots. And then the other component, watch to see if Blackshear gets in foul trouble. If Blackshear gets in foul trouble, Zion will have a field day inside. Uh, but if that, if they can, but he can hold up just like Taco Fall was able to hold up for UCF. A, a quick correction. It was only one time that Duke and Vatek played during the regular yeah. season. I think I said two earlier. Uh, but Titel, the bottom half of the bracket, we saw LSU uh, come by, get by Maryland there in a game that a lot of us were picking an upset in, and they get to play Michigan State now, who kind of rolled through the first two rounds. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the talk on the old interwebs is about whether LSU traveled on that final game-winning uh, layup with one and a half seconds left. I saw it. It looked clean at the time. Obviously, it could go either way, but um, just it's amazing to think if you look at LSU's entire season when you're starting off when having a player shot and killed in September and then you get to finish the season the regular season with the coach suspended indefinitely due to the whole FBI thing and they just overcome all these obstacles like any other team it seems like would have collapsed two months ago I don't know how they're doing it well, I'll tell you what, you're going to be in D.C., I understand, for the East Regional semifinals and final. Anything you're looking forward to in, in that game, LSU-Michigan State? I mean, do you think they can keep doing it? So a couple of things. One, um, I don't just because even though Michigan State is banged up with uh, Nick Ward's back, but Joshua Langford is still out, and Kyle Aarons, I believe, is going to be out. Um, just when you bring in a guy, Tony Benford, who has been a head coach before, I just find it hard to believe that an assistant coach can beat Tom Izzo in March. It's because I don't think many coaches can beat Tom Izzo in March. Obviously, there's other components of the game. Cassius Winston against Tremont Waters, a fantastic point guard matchup, possibly the best that we have in the Sweet 16. But I think I have Sparty winning that game. Right. And, 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 and yeah, Bedford's been a head coach before, David. But if we want to talk about a coach that could get 20 lost seasons, he's actually, he was excellent at it, wasn't he? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, David, uh, who do you think comes out of this region now? I, I still got to go with Duke, although um, I, I've been impressed with Virginia Tech in the latter part of the season and mm-hmm. in, in how healthy they've been. Uh, I thought that they did beat. I thought that they did play them twice. I thought that it was a home and home, but maybe not because I thought they beat them in Blacksburg. Like, okay. No, no, they did. It, okay. it was just one game. Okay, I must have been drunk or something. Uh, but um, cool. Virginia Tech has had Duke's number a lot. I mean, this isn't the first year where an upset happened with these teams. Yeah. Now, the first time that they played, I mean, Duke absolutely smoked them, and it, it's kind of hard to get over that. But I. I you know, I, I, I'm still going to go with Duke, but I, uh, you know, especially with Michigan State not being at full strength. But I don't know. I think that I, I'm not as sold on it as I was a week ago. Well, it's going to be an exciting East region. And Stalika, let me go to you here as we scroll down. Let's go over to the West region, uh, where just like in the East, we have the top four seeds made it through to the Sweet 16 as Gonzaga got by Baylor and Florida State uh, took out that Murray State team that had knocked out Marquette in the first round. Marquette was one of, I guess you could say, several Big East no-shows. It's not surprising. Big East (laughs) no-showed. It's not surprising in a vacuum when you consider how badly Marquette had finished and how well Murray State had finished. Florida State had also played like they were a team on a mission and as we found out, I think it was after the Florida State Vermont game, Phil Kofer's father had actually passed away, I think, prior to that game, and they found out after the fact. So Kofer himself is not going to be playing against Gonzaga, but they are going to be playing in his father's memory. But yeah, by yeah. the same token, I think this is a Gonzaga team that probably beats the Knolls, but ultimately not going to be able to top Michigan in the region this year. Well, and this is a rematch of last year's Sweet 16 game, What wasn't it? Yeah, it, Sweet it was, but yeah. Gonzaga was not completely healthy that year. Right. Uh, but, uh, Joby, the bottom half of the West region yeah. also saw the top two seeds advance, including a Texas Tech very impressive over a Buffalo yeah. team that a lot of us – well, a lot of you liked heading into the tournament. I had Texas State I, by Final I Four, was but. not, if you remember, I was <laughs> picking Arizona State over Buffalo, and I was wrong okay. on that. But I, I was correct that Texas Tech would be sitting here. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but they look great. They, they, I mean, they're the one, they're the last man standing uh, for the Big 12. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, 
but they've been they've been I think truly have been the best team overall once Kansas got the injury bug for the Big 12. They they're not bad team to uh be holding and raising the flag and they have they have a real shot. They plays tremendous defense. Chris Beard is I mean, come on. Do we have any doubt how good a coach this guy is now? Not at all. He's okay. Uh, I, I think he is in we didn't mention this during the coaching news. Uh he will return next yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but, I hope with a nice extension. And, yeah. Uh, good, yeah, great. Uh, and, and he did put some good pieces together with Mooney, but yeah, give Texas Tech credit, and we're going to get a great game, I he, think, uh, with in the coaching ranks with Beeline up next. Yeah, yeah, and Ty, tell that Michigan team uh, taking out Florida, who actually the first round knocked out a Nevada team that, that had had some final four talk heading into the season. Uh, I think at, at the end of the day, a pretty disappointing season for, for Nevada. Would you say that? Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's fair. I really had high hopes for um, Nevada, but obviously uh, Joby's favorite Utah State team kind of derailed them a couple of weeks ago. And, um, I really like Florida. Like, they have two incoming McDonald's All-Americans next year, so I think they're even going to get better for Mike White. But uh, Michigan really controlled the whole game, I think, from start to finish. And the fact that they can balance the scoring where if Brasdakis doesn't show up, which he didn't against Florida, the five points, they can depend on Jordan Poole, who hit the famous – uh, three-pointer that David referenced earlier and the defense is obviously we talk about Texas Tech's defense Michigan's not that bad for a 30-win team and they also keep it clean like it's not just that they're banging and banging Florida had two free throw attempts all game it's hard to win when you're only getting in the line for two appearance for two shots uh, I gotta tell you of all the games of the Sweet 16 this Michigan Texas Tech game I think has a chance to be the best of them all and, and there's a lot of good games coming here which yeah, I that? like both of these I, yeah. I, I mean Florida State uh, and I know that I've said this before uh, started off one in four in conference play the only game that they have lost other than the they've lost two since then one was the ACC championship game the other was at the buzzer to Duke this is a team that's been playing like a Final Four team for a long time. By the way, uh, all four of the ACC semifinalists still in the tournament. Yeah, uh, ACC, five teams left. The Big 12 had a pretty good first round. Only the one team left in Texas Tech, though. Uh, Big 10, who had a pretty good first round, uh, had kind of a few stumbles in the That's second three. Also, yeah. Those wow. three left, though. Uh, but um, – Let's scroll over a bit here to the Midwest region. Hopefully, I should be centered on the screen right now. And um, actually, Joby, let me start with you up top there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because, because, and, and let's talk about Utah State. I mean, let's talk about North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Pac-12. Didn't think I'd be saying that, did you? <laughs> or at any point a week ago. But thank you, Pac-12, for vindicating me. I feel feel so good. But then Carolina decided to take it to Washington the very next day or the very next round. This Carolina team is starting to play pretty darn well. But yes, they were losing to Iona in the first round at half. But I, you know, but they weren't the only one seed who did that. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> they, I, this Carolina team is strong. I think they are on a collision course. Sorry to, you know, give my preview. They're on a collision course with Big Blue. It'll be the Blues will be coming together in Kansas City. But. Well, I, I, I got to say though, Ty, Ty tell Auburn uh, has been playing some unbelievable basketball. Just not, in, not just this tournament, but the last month or two here, month or so here. True. I think Joby's point is correct. Just because like Auburn was this close to losing to New Mexico State, so like. I agree they were dominant the week before in the SEC tourney. They've been – they were look great against Kansas, although a depleted Kansas team with no Ezebuki and no Vic. Um, I think Carolina will be too much for Auburn based on the New Mexico State game. But if they play like the rest of the month, then it should be a good game. But I think Carolina should win handily. I okay. agree with that. Um, Dave, what about the bottom half of the bracket here, though, David? The Kentucky and, 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 and this Houston team who, uh, who look pretty darn good, too. Yeah, um, really, really excited for this Kentucky-Houston game. A couple of things. Kentucky, no problem with Abilene Christian. Wofford, who we were big on all year, a phenomenal shooting team, could not hit anything against Kentucky and was still right in the game. The margin was only – if, if Fletcher McGee had had a bad day, they would have won this game. Yeah, right. You put it that way. That's how bad he had. A, he had a, probably he had, a, he had the worst day of his entire career. Atrocious day. If he had now, just had a bad day, they would have won the game. 
Yeah. yeah, and I don't want to dismiss it as Walford having a really bad shooting day. They did, but part of that was Kentucky scouted Late. them and defended them perfectly. If you watch the game, it was really impressive that from a tactical standpoint, how they defended them, how they double teamed him, how they face guarded him. Uh, the, every Anyone that says John Calipari just like lives and dies on talent and can't really coach, he gets a lot of talent, but that's that's a bunch of bunk. This was a well coached, well prepared Kentucky team, and they needed it because without that, like this was a good Walford team. I think it almost speaks to how good they were that they could have that atrocious of a shooting day and still come that close to beating Kentucky. Thank but, you, David. That my thoughts exactly, and that needs to be reemphasized. I agree a hundred percent. Oh, which part? I, I take all the credit I can get. Yeah, no, Calipari, people do not. You know, I don't. I want to emphasize that point. Calipari, yeah. especially precise to what you're talking about on the defensive end, that was Calipari's game planning. It was excellent. And you could see it and hear it in his voice at halftime with some of his frustration focusing on that, despite them playing pretty darn well at that point. It was very clear what his game plan was. It was executed. And to the players, uh, the players' credit, they did. They executed. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Sleek, let me bring in here, though. Uh, this Kentucky-Houston game, oh, especially with, with P.J. Washington still, I guess, being a bit of a question mark. We don't know for certain for Kentucky. Uh, you know, what about this game? You know, Ken Houston, who's also been, had a great season, knock off Big Blue. I had to look up some of the scores because Houston had their biggest blowout, actually, in uh, program history in the NCAA tournament. Even the five Slamma Jamma teams, even the Elvin Hayes teams, never had a, a day like they did against a Georgia State or even, for that matter, a relatively easy win against Ohio State because I don't think they've ever had a back-to-back double-digit victories. This but is their it, first Sweet 16 since five, fly, five yeah, Slamma Jamma. Yeah, yeah, since 84, isn't it? Since 1984. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is going to be a somewhat evenly matched game. It's not going to be in Louisville like we had all hoped, but some some of people describe this as actually one of the more, uh, shall we say, corrupt regions between Auburn, Houston, Kentucky, and <laughs> North Carolina. <laughs> okay, so okay. We're just looking on the court. I think this could actually be one of the better defensive yeah, who would have thought Kelvin Sampson would have the least amount of clout? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, t- 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 you got a little P.J. Washington news for us? Uh, I just read someone that said Calipari announced today that P.J.'s cast should come off tomorrow. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know if he can get it ready by the weekend, but uh, certainly promising. And uh, the bad thing is I fear that they might need him. I think they will need him for Carolina. They might need him for Houston. This is a team that only had six turnovers uh, in the win over Ohio State. This is a great defensive team, and they're going to need all the offense they can get. Uh, I think they need it for Houston. I think this Houston team is as good as any team they've played all season. I, I agree. This is the – I mean, this is the best team Houston has played. It's the biggest stage that they've played on. But I, I definitely think they are up to the challenge, even though they haven't been on this stage quite like Kentucky. I like that they're in the Sweet 16. Not to go off on a Zach Singer-type tangent, but Houston, very storied history. I think you have to credit them for – making college basketball as popular as it was with some of the showcase games, particularly the UCLA and then game against the Astrodome and then five slamma jamma. A lot of people don't know this, but it kind of made basketball more of a national brand than a regional brand. They weren't the only ones, but they were part of it. They have been dormant and absent for so long. Uh, Basketball fans were familiar with them last year, but I think to transcend just the basketball fan and to the, and come across to the casual fan or just the regular person, you have to make the Sweet 16. I'm kind of glad that they're in it, Um, and I think they got a chance to win this game. Let's move on up here on the screen to the uh, South region in Louisville. And, Joby, let me start with you because your Virginia team came out of the top after, just as you told us, they actually got a good first-half test from Gardner-Webb and, and uh, had a few butterflies there, a little bit scared. Didn't they? Uh, what are you talking about? They, they, there was no, there was no <laughs> doubt at all. You, you, um, the, you know, Gardner-Webb had an amazing game plan. I've never seen a team dissect a Bennett defense better uh, strategically. They, they get geeky on it. They – Virginia loves one of the things the Virginia defense does so well is to hedge in a double team up top. 
and you know they get the ball and then they rotate over so well and it's just a, it's a choreographed it's amazing but what Gardner Webb is they got in the dead middle of it so the two sides didn't know which way to rotate and the guy had no intention of running and being a, a screener up top he just ran to the basket as soon as the Virginia guy got it. they got five layup layups before that point and I never see a layup against Virginia unless it's Zion Williamson getting a quick step <laughs> you know so it was really well done by Gardner Webb give him credit it was awesome and the you could feel it as a Virginia fan oh my god this is happening again and the best example that, that halftime came <laughs> that did halftime well what happened was they were being you know Virginia's being doubled up 28-14 uh, and Virginia cut it to six at right before half they did the adjustment on the pit on the roll that I said and the only two baskets Gardner Webb had were threes shooting over the Virginia defense yeah. when it became 36-30 at half, as a Virginia fan, you go, this is over. This is different. And then the next game, you could see in the players' eyes, the way the players moved against Oklahoma, totally different team. It was the Virginia team we've seen all year. That is a very encouraging thing. And it was, you know, it was a thing of beauty to a Virginia fan because it was – Oklahoma definitely had their trip to the dentist office. Well, yeah. Ty, Ty, you are a Pac-12 guy, and all season we, we – beat up on the Pac-12. Somehow they got three teams in, thanks in part to Oregon winning the Pac-12 tournament. Each of those three teams picked up at least one win in the tournament. Oregon now has two. Uh, way better year than last year here. <laughs> way better year than the Big East in the tournament. Uh, way better year than several other conferences already. Uh, how about the Oregon Ducks, who, as we predicted last week, beat UC Irvine, as we predicted, and, and, and made to the Sweet 16? <laughs> The uh, lone uh, non chalkiness on the old bracket. Uh, props to the Ducks and Coach Altman. I still don't know how you lose Bull Bull after nine games and then go on this amazing run. Like, it just doesn't compute that you lose this high school All American, arguably on his way to being Pac 12 Player of the Year, and then you get better. Um, it's been an amazing thing. And to Joby's point, like, Virginia's looking great and they got past the opening jitters and, like, it's hard to pick against them, and they have the great defense. But make no mistake, the best defensive player in that game is going to be Kenny Wooten. Yeah, I, I was just three out of four years with the Sweet 16 now for Oregon, too. It, it's, you know, yeah, it is. you kind of don't realize what a good job Dana Holman's done there recently. It's right because uh, they kind of have these lousy regular seasons and put it together late. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, the run has gone like this. Uh, they were a one seed that made the Elite Eight, a three seed that made the Final Four, an NIT team, or did they even make the NIT team a year ago? It, it, bad a year ago. Yeah. Bad all year for most of the year this year, and then went on a rampage in the last half of conference play and, and played their way into the Sweet 16. So a really remarkable run for the Ducks, and – you're right. I, I don't know why it didn't ha it, it didn't resonate, but they have been one of the better teams in the country over the last four years. I, you know, they've won nine tournament games in four years. Their Ken Palm rating over the last, I think, month uh, is third highest. Uh, really? Which is wow. amazing, only behind Virginia. Well, well you uh, remember the, 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 it's Virginia and Purdue. It's the, Purdue and Virginia. They, they ended the regular season by beating both the Arizona schools mm -hmm. and Washington, and then and then they made the run of the Pac-12 tournament where they beat Arizona State and what and Washington. I mean, they they beat all the top teams in the Pac-12 multiple times. Yeah, right they down, did right down the stretch. Uh, so no surprise that they beat Wisconsin and the Irvine tried to give them a game. I no no surprise that they beat a pretty good Irvine team. And too. what's interesting right. is their overall season was so poor mm -hmm. before that run that they got the 12 and St. Mary's got the 11, with St. Mary's <laughs> only having one win. Yeah, let's, yeah, no. let's talk St. Mary's. Let's bring our Big East guy in here, uh, Mr. Stalika, who uh, saw the – where we saw the lone Big East win of the entire tournament in, 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 in down in Hartford when Villanova beat St. Mary's. To be honest with you, I'm wondering how many fans actually saw that because one of the things that happened between, was, uh, yeah. Yeah, between sessions of that – Hartford afternoon games because they ended around 7 p.m. They had to clear out the arena. So by mm. halftime, it was still just a family and friends who got to see Villanova pulled off St. Mary's. For I gotta, say, I gotta say, this is absolutely ridiculous that they yes, don't it get is. more time in between sessions when they know this happens. 
the, absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, and, and it was it, it was kind of doomed to begin with. It's it's poor planning, and you, you're absolutely there's no excuse for this at all. And I know that they wanted the game. What, what I guess they wanted the games to tip at seven o'clock. I know that they pay a billion dollars for this year. So tip the game, no tip game at eight to eight thirty and go yeah. wait one, one spell. Well, one. my question is, why yeah. were they tipping off the, the afternoon session at two in the afternoon when you already had some uh, West Coast or not West Coast, but games in Salt Lake City that were tipping around yeah. one thirty that happened to be I think eleven thirty local mountain yeah. time. Right. Exactly. Right. To, to tip tip those Hartford games earlier so you can only have one game in the four to six bracket. Yeah. No games in the four to six time period. I don't care. And, and I, it's my understanding that, that the networks basically control the tip times. Yeah, they do. Uh, so I know everybody's big mad at the NCAA and, and the people at Hartford. But, it, I, I mean, with that, this should have never happened. Or if you're going to do it that way, then there needs to be some sort of plan in place to where people can get into the game that have tickets for the evening session. Uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know how to execute that, but what they ended up doing was they cleared the arena and then they had everybody, they, then they had everybody queued up and lined up, and it literally took them until halftime to get everybody inside for the second game. And these are people that travel a long way, paid a lot of money to be there. If you traveled from, from, from California to come see your St. Mary's team and you got to miss half the game, I would have been furious. Yeah. Uh, and, and you should, rightfully so. And uh, this doesn't happen in any – could you imagine had this happened to the World Series or at the NFL playoffs to where they couldn't get half the fans into the arena before halftime? Uh, let, let, let's, uh, let's turn to the, what's happened on the court there, Titel. Uh, Purdue comes out of that bracket, and they're going to go up now against Tennessee, who got by Colgate and then Iowa. Carson Edwards is turning back into the Big Ten player of the year. He was terrible, frankly – in February, he played seven games in Big Ten play, made 12 threes for the month of February. He's made 13 in the NCAA tournament in like three days. He made four of 12 against ODU and destroyed Villanova, nine of 16, 42 points. It kind of got lost probably because the media and the fans were not in the arena at the time or something, but <laughs> it was also like not as exciting a game, 87 to 61. It was hard to maintain interest. 42 points against the defending champs. This should be a bigger story than it is, right? Uh, it, it was amazing. And, and I think this is another right. fascinating game here, this Purdue-Tennessee game. J Joby, your, your thoughts on who, who comes out? Yeah, no, it, you know, we mentioned the Texas Tech, Mich yeah. uh, we mentioned Texas Tech, Michigan. Rightfully so, it's a game we should be looking forward to. This is the game I point to. Really? This is the game I go, wow, this could be a real barn burner. Because Tennessee is for real. They could have been a one. at you know, I mean, things play out differently in conference tournaments. They might be. And they are no doubt a legitimate two. And Purdue is playing great basketball. As I mentioned, their Ken Palm numbers being, I think they are number one right now uh, over the last month in Ken Palm. Uh, despite uh, uh, a handful, a uh, couple of losses in Michigan schools. We also talk about a team like uh, Duke having one escape. Tennessee actually had two escapes. Yes, the game Col they were, they, the Colgate gave them much, much trouble. And Tennessee was blowing out Iowa. Like, I turned the channel. Yep. And all of a sudden, I look up and I go, overtime? What? <laughs> yeah, I, I had to literally go back yeah, and, and watch that game unbelievable but you know what could this be a duke situation i i'll never forget it i mean you know when florida won their national title one of their national titles earlier with young but no they barely escaped butler and yeah. i thought oh this florida team they're not going to repeat oh they're they're no good this year next thing you know they're cutting down the nets you escape it makes you tougher i i and that's what who knows if that is going to happen with tennessee but it very well may have uh, well, what I did here is I've scrolled back a little bit. I know it's little, maybe a little tough to read because it's a little small now, but i uh, got the whole bracket on the single screen here. I want to run through each of you. Given where we are heading into this Sweet 16, uh, who are your final four picks now? Who are the four teams you think come out of this coming weekend? Let's just run through everybody with that question. And, uh, David, why don't I start with you on that? I'm going to go with Duke, uh, Florida State. I, I like this for Virginia. Wow. wow. And um, I kind of like this – North Carolina team. You're going all ACC Final Four. Yeah, which would be – I, I realize that that would be a huge anomaly. This Florida State-Gonzaga game is a super good game. It wouldn't shock me at all if the Zags won. I, I picked them to get to the Final Four. 
before, but Florida State is just playing really well. I know in the tournament that they've beaten a 13 and a 12. They've yet to play a team that was actually inside the bubble. But when you go back another week and look at the teams that they beat a week ago, and when you look at the teams that they beat in the latter part of the season, this is a team that is on fire. And I don't think it has resonated with most, with a lot of people, how well this Florida State team is actually playing and how good the teams are that they've beaten. I don't even think they should have been on the four line. I, I, I mean, they really shouldn't have been. Uh, uh, Salika, who's your final four now? I'm going to borrow a line from a former UNC head coach, Bill Guthridge. Michigan State has actually beaten Michigan three times, but I think Michigan State is actually going to beat the Wolverines home from the NCAA tournament because I think Duke <laughs> and Carolina both get in along with Tennessee and, yes, the Michigan Wolverines. You're going Michigan there with the three ace, uh, with those teams. Uh, uh, Joby. Uh, I, think, I think Virginia had their scare and Virginia – is playing the type of game that I want. I'll just get my homer pick out of the way <laughs> and just say it. I like the Zags still. Uh, I think out west, I think they're going to be in, in great in great view. I like the – despite – I agree with everything everybody said about the other three teams in those regions. Kentucky, I'm going to stick with Kentucky. Carolina's mm-hmm. playing great, but I'm going to stick with Kentucky. I'm going to say Washington's healthy by that game. Um, and then this is the tough one. Uh, Izzo – Shashevsky, I think it will be the matchup. And, you know, Tom, Tom Izzo just has got something. And he seems to get always take his team one spot higher than where they are seated, which means Michigan State in this one. The older kids take advantage of the younger kids. All right. Um, let me throw mine out, then Titel will go to you to, to, to end this uh, section. But my final four picks, I do agree on Duke uh, and with some of you. I like Tennessee coming out of the South. I'm going to go very different from anybody, though, in the Midwest and the West. I'm going with both Texas schools. I'm going Houston and Texas Tech making the final four. I think uh, I, I could see – those are very good picks, Chad. Yeah. I mean, it's not who I picked, but those – this Houston team is rolling, and I do think that they get by Kentucky. I just don't see them getting by North Carolina. Well, uh, Titel, how about finishing it off here? I think Duke easily gets in out of D.C. In the West, if Gonzaga was playing anywhere but the West, I would take Texas Tech, but I really think the Zags are going to be having some home time zone advantage against the rest of these teams. In the Midwest, I think it really depends on P.J. Washington's leg. If healthy, I think it's him. If not, I'll go with the heels. And I just can't pick Virginia. They have burned me too much in the past. (laughs) I can't believe I'm picking Purdue because they're not a better team than the other teams in the South. But Carson Edwards is playing like the best player in America, so I'm going to ride him all the way to the Final Four. So no one took took LSU, no one took Oregon, no one took Auburn. There's your final four right there. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Let me ask uh, you one other question, Titel. Who is harder to pick, Virginia in this decade or Arizona in the 1990s when they were either <laughs> losing early in the first round or going to the final four? Arizona definitely mm-hmm. broke my heart in the first round many, many times. Thank you, Steve Nash and Keith, Mr. Jennings and all those guys. But we finally got over the hump, and maybe this is the year Virginia does, but – Joby, I'm telling you, like, I'm glad they made it this far and they're good enough to win it all. I just, I'm not a believer just yet. I'll tell you what, at this point, let me run through everybody for any other final thoughts. Um, and Joby, why don't I start with you? Because he just asked you a question too. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, like I said, yeah, I hinted at, yeah, they always say Virginia is like, playing Virginia is like going to the dentist's office. And I think, I think uh, there's going to be a lot of teeth pulled from Oregon uh, to begin with, hopefully. Um, but I think what, what is really neat about what you're seeing here is this is the most, and I think everybody knows this before I say it, but wow, have we ever seen something so chalky <laughs> than we ever have? Only two teams are below the four seed, and one of them's an Auburn Five. team <laughs> who was better than their four. Okay, <laughs> let's be blunt here. <laughs> and, and then Oregon, again, who had a four. Uh, who also had a four, who was wounded and probably shouldn't have been seated that high. So it's about and, – and Hoops HD picked. You know, it's not like this was some crazy 12. This is, a, as we talk about, a legit team uh, that has gotten this far. 
Uh, I don't think we've ever seen something like that. And I'd love to see the history because we've talked about it in the past of well, we certainly that we're seeing, see last you know, the, it, this is similar <laughs> to the ACC tournament and with five ACC teams where we saw so much power in seeding advance. And now that seeding has come through, not just for the ACC schools involved in that seeding, but the SEC schools involved in that seeding and, and, and so on and so on, and the Big Ten and so on. Uh, well, well, before we go any further, Joby, you, you mentioned the Hoops HD pick. I want to throw this up here on the screen real quick. Uh, this is the br bracket that we put together last week here on the show. Uh, we correctly picked at our consensus back here, 26 out of 32 first round games, 13 out of 16 games correctly, the Sweet 16. Our entire Elite Eight still alive. Uh, if you did not listen to us last week when we put this together, you're probably losing your pool. If you did listen to us, <laughs> you had a great shot to win it. That's all I got to say here. Uh, you know, and, I, and and you and just like me, you'll be shooting the middle finger at Iowa State. But 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 look at this. I mean, we, we had that Oregon over UC Irvine game picked yeah. absolutely correctly. For Liberty example. was impressive. Liberty too. we had, uh, but let me pull this down here and Sleek. Let me go to you for your final thoughts. Well, Vanderbilt had uh, disappointed the city in Nashville this year. Look no further than the Battle of Boulevard to redeem the city, as both Belmont and Lipscomb continue to make some decent runs of their own. Belmont got their first ever NCAA tournament win in the first four against Temple and actually gave Maryland a pretty good game in round one. And while that was going on, uh, Lipscomb actually won their first two road games in the NIT. One was at Davidson and one was at a pasting at our Greensboro on Saturday. And they could pull the trifecta with a win at NC State because that's going to be their next trip in the NIT quarterfinals. Yeah, how about the A Sun as a whole? Uh, NJIT undefeated in the CIT, only one postseason loss for the entire Atlantic Sun Conference. So, congrats wow. on the league. Yeah, that's and so Liberty fun. winning a game in the tournament. So. Yep. Uh, Titel. Um, I am so excited to go to the East Regional this weekend in DC, and I'm going to give you uh, all the readers and viewers of our great little website as much all access stuff as I can to give you a taste of the four teams um, and some quick fun facts. We got Trey Jones. His brother was named tournament most outstanding player just four years ago at Duke. You got Fred Hoiberg's kid, Jack, who's a walk-on point guard at Michigan state. You got Will Reese at LSU who was pitching on the LSU baseball team and made the college world series finals in 2017 Two years later, he might make the final four. I don't know if I've ever heard of that before. And, of course, Virginia Tech freshman guard Brendan Palmer. His mother's name, Jackie Robinson. Wow. Wow. <laughs> hey, yeah. David, let me let you finish things out for us. Uh, a couple of quick tidbits. Uh, Joby mentioned this, but I thought it was interesting. Three of the four one seeds, all four obviously got through. Three of them were trailing at halftime. Uh, that was rather fascinating. It didn't seem like until recently that – you, you could count – there were maybe 10 examples ever of a number one seed trailing in the second half to a 16 seed. Um, while it was pretty chalky, uh, we say this every year, if you follow under the radar, which uh, I know Stalika and Chad, you do, but uh, while they don't have the paper profiles and they don't have the scorecards, typically when you look at the 9, 10, and 11, 12 lines, I would much rather play the team's – most of them anyway, on the 9, 10, and or 11 than I would on the 12. And here we are again, three 12 seeds getting through. And I know one of them was Oregon. They weren't under the radar. And another one nearly getting through. If you saw what Auburn did to Kansas, you can't help but have liked New Mexico State's chances had they not had a rather one of the more crazier ends to a game that we've seen. We didn't talk about that, but this was a team that had – a layup to tie the game that they passed on, kicked it out for a three, got fouled, hit one of the three free throws, got the rebound, and then couldn't get the tip it. A crazy ending, almost as crazy as UCF. But again, I was – these 12 seeds, you, you kind of like seeing those upsets, especially when you follow the teams all year like we do, because while none of them got through to the Sweet 16, there are no under-the-radar teams in it. Last year there was only one and that was Loyola Chicago, uh, sometimes getting through to the round of 32 kind of validates that these teams are for real. And you kind of hope that people remember that as they watch basketball throughout the year next year and remember some of these teams. Uh, Liberty is going to be really good next year. Irvine, yeah. I think they lose quite a bit. But some of these teams, you know, are going to be pretty strong. And they can use this as a catalyst to move forward. 
Well, on that note, I do want to thank everyone for joining us. Unfortunately, we are out of time, so our AC8 update well, was going to have well, to. Well, yeah, let's, let, let's, let's talk about the AC8. No, uh, David, we're out of time. I'm sorry. Guy, and on behalf of John. You forgot the uh, basketball. Uh, we showed up and there were no basketballs. It's coming forward to David Gray. There were no balls. How do we get him? How do we mute this? The puppet. There we go. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week with our final four preview. Uh, and uh, have a great evening, everybody. And we'll talk to you again real soon.